Welcome to Money Matters TV. I'm Mike Dever, founder and CEO of Brandywine Asset Management. And my co-host today is Jeff Watkinson of Watkinson Capital Advisors, Muni Bond Specialists. Our guest today is Amanda Procia, COO and founder of Lightspeed PR. Well, hello, Jeff. Hi, Mike. How are you? Hey, good, thank you. Um, I think we talked, we had some Muni Bond talk last fall, maybe going into the winter. Um, you know, at that time, we had just uh, you had been pointing out how we just hit the, the highest yield since the mid-2000s, maybe it was. Um, looks like there are a lot of different opportunities. You know, how did the year end, and what do you see going forward here? Mike, that's a great memory. Uh, I can see why you're successful. Uh, very good memory. Um, I think when I was in in the fall... You know, August 2023 yields hit a 15 year high due to selling pressure, uncertainty about the Federal Reserve. It was really selling. And the yields got even more attractive in September. And then they got extremely attractive in October as the selling pressure ramped up. And it's interesting about munis. I mean, Approximately 70% of the asset class is controlled by individual investors, retail, right. non-professional, non-institutional. And I was totally, pounding the totally different from the uh, the mutual fund industry with the institutional participation and, and everybody coming in through maybe a 401k plan or something. Exactly. Exactly. And it's interesting. Munis always come back. And that's throughout time and memoriam, throughout history, they always come back and it's a huge selling point and it comforts uh, investors that you will get your money back. And despite this, people, there's still immense selling pressure. So we had this chart and it, you know, the last you know, seven times that the municipal bonds have had a negative year, 2022 was a negative year. Over the last 40 years, 40 years since the early 80s, there hasn't been back-to-back -back negative years. So, Mike, here we are, September, October, and my business partner, he's going, that's my father, he's going, bring out the chart, send it to clients. We've never had back-to-back -back negative years. And we were negative at the end of October. And I go, Bill, I mean this might be a different paradigm over the last 40 years. He goes, the year isn't over yet. And sure enough, in November, the, the market had the biggest monthly rally in the history of the municipal bond market. Wow. And you've seen, you saw stocks have that Christmas or you know, Santa yeah. Claus rally, same thing in municipal bond land. And he was right, but it took 10 months of, I don't know this year. And, and now, so individual investors have a pretty strong reputation of being on the wrong side of markets, um, calling the bottoms, buying you know, like tech stocks at the peak. Um, how are they with the muni bond market? Are you able to convince them in that environment that, hey, it's a great buy now and they listen to you? Or are they still just so nervous they couldn't do it? The answer is kind of, I felt like I was beating the drum really hard and staying on message. And I have a couple older gentlemen in the industry who I rely on and I ask for their constructive criticism. They've been in the business 40, 50 years. And they said, Jeff, you, you're, you're on point, you're on message. Uh, you got to just stick with it. I didn't want to sound like a used car salesman or a, demagogue like yeah. this is a great time to buy um and you're right but what's interesting and one more point you've you've read the dow bar studies which shows you know the average equity mutual fund returns 10 percent a year the average equity mutual fund investor does three percent <laughs> massive underperformance just like you talked about you know they buy high they sell low they don't Pure mistiming. They, they, they try to time it. I read a study a couple of years ago that equity investors have have narrowed that gap. They've gotten better with their behavior. 
municipal bond investors have not. Oh. I found that shocking, but that's, uh, I found it shocking, but it's true. And municipal yeah. bond investors are extremely skittish and tend to do the worst thing at the worst time. Well, so what do you see now? I mean, you're, you're banging the drum in October, November. We had that big rally. So you don't have the same yields you had then as an opportunity. Is it still a good opportunity? What do you see in 24? Great question. Um, we're seeing a lot better yield pickup, extending duration, going further out on the curve. Um, bonds, we usually wouldn't go out 17, 18, 20, 25 years in maturity, but the yield pickup is significant. I mean, we're looking at 120, 140 more basis points, terrific credits, and we're you know, deploying a barbell approach where we're going long out 20, 25 years. And then we're also buying bonds with maturities less than eight years. Um, so we're not too far with our duration. But it's interesting. This, the second point is municipals are tied to the treasury market. Sure. And the treasury market got softer in January, and it was a soft month. Everybody was expecting January to be gun ho We had momentum. Uh, it was a negative month. It was the only the third negative January over the last 10 years. So it was kind of a rare occurrence. So things bonds we were bidding on last week got a lot cheaper this week. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I, I think after that Fed meeting, you know, and, and the, the press conference, you know, with Powell afterwards, people, there was, there was a lot of bullish enthusiasm for lower rates built into the, the market, I think, just sentiment-wise. And that just flipped, you know, a matter of a couple of days, uh, that flipped. So they provided a little more opportunity. Um, that, now, are your clients, do they generally, when you're buying something that's, 20 years out, are they buying that with a, a liability in mind 20 years out that they're trying to satisfy or do they trade out of that prior to that? Some, some clients, some clients don't want bonds that long, but people buy these bonds for the income. And, you know, we have a new, we had a new account. It's about a million dollars. And we're essentially selling bonds with yields less than 3% and then securing a 4% yield further out on the curve. We're talking twelve to $14,000 difference in annual income. Right, right. So they're buying for income. It makes sense. That they're buying for income and then reinvest that income. Okay, so we have a viewer question here, um, Jeff. It is, um, okay, it's... What are the differences and or advantages between general obligation and revenue bonds? This comes from Jane Marks in Philadelphia. Jane, thanks for the question. Uh, general obligation. Uh, that is That bond is backed by the credit and the taxing power of that municipality, authority, state, city, county. Um, the revenue to pay off that bond. You know, the, the money, the capital to pay off that bond and to fulfill the debt holders is due to the debt taxing power. A revenue bond, a good example of a revenue bond would be a bridge. You pay a toll, you go over the bridge, the tolls from the drivers pay off the bond holders. Um, what is the diff you know, what are the advantages? It really depends on the underlying credit. Um, it really depends on the underlying credit. And then in addition, there's something called a double barreled municipal bond where if there's not enough revenue being derived from the project, like a community college, there's not enough revenue to fund the school, they can make up the shortfall through the taxing ability. But we all know that we all know, you know, the pitfalls, you know, is, is the municipality, are they gaining uh, inhabitants? What's the taxpayer base like? Are people going to leave? The city, if they raise taxes too much, um, those are all threats to a GO. And obviously, a revenue bond. We're talking uh, people going over the bridge, the New York City uh, metro, the subway system. That would—that's a revenue bond. That and was an issue. 
double barrel gives you the, the belts and suspenders. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, I appreciate right. it. <laughs> You're welcome, Jeff. Um, okay, so Money Matters TV, as you see, does take audience questions. If you're interested, here's how to send your questions in to Money Matters TV. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. Okay, thank you. I'd now like to introduce today's guest, Amanda Procia, COO and founder of Lightspeed PR. Hello, Amanda. Hello, Mike. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you. So share us a little bit about your background and uh, how you get into PR, and we'll, we'll dig a little more deeper after that. Yeah, sure. I, I've been doing this for about 30 years now, which I can't even believe. But um, I started out doing uh, PR for big agencies, primarily in New York, um, you know, where they divide you into different focus groups. My focuses were either marketing or corporate, which led me to a bit of more of the financial PR side and kind of a grab bag of a whole different kinds of clients. I worked with Procter & Gamble, Kellogg's, Honeywell, Xerox. Um, and then I went in-house at American Express to do in her internal communications there. And for the past 10 years, I've run my own agency with, with my co-founder, uh, Lightspeed PR. Okay, so the um, it, it sounds like you gravitated with the Amex um, into more of the, the fintech world, you know, not the consumer products and, and, and things you were doing with P&G, for example, and some of the other clients you had? Yes, you could say that. Yes, I, I took a bit more of a focus into, into the financial side, yes. Hey, Amanda, I'd like to jump in here. Um, can you... I think I know what PR is. Can, can you really define like what are the responsibilities and functions that PR that you would do for a company? Yes, absolutely. And I love when people ask me that question because I'm learning more and more, especially since I've run my own agency, that a lot of people just really don't understand what public relations is. They think they do, but it's a little bit more under the radar than most people recognize. Public relations is about managing a company's image or brand. Um, and we do it primarily through earned media. We liaise with uh, reporters and journalists uh, all day long trying to get our clients in the news or get their opinion um, as part of an ongoing news story, as expert commentary. Um, sometimes we can dabble a bit with social media or other channels where, where the message isn't paid for like it would be with an advertisement. That's in a nutshell what PR is. Do you, you, you mentioned the social media side. So how much of your work is in getting placement in an article or in actually helping create content that can be posted on social media, different LinkedIn groups or uh, things like that that may get exposure for your clients? Typical PR really is more in the first group where we're working with the media and trying to earn our clients an article or, or a commentary within an article. Um, while social media is becoming a bigger piece of the puzzle, it still is a bit of a more discrete category. It's what we will term as digital media or earned, earned organic posts. So uh, we actually have a separate team within my agency that, that handles social and digital media while the vast majority of us are still out there talking to the press and, and trying to get published articles and reports like that. So, man, I got a question. I I have my own business. I'm 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 doing LinkedIn. I'm doing a newsletter. I, I work on the website all the time. Um, you, as a PR specialist with with some of your clients, you would work with the marketing department and or, um, you know, at least communicate with them and be on the same page with them. How, how does how does that interaction work? Yeah, absolutely. That's primarily who we work with at our clients, uh, within our clients' businesses. We work with their marketing team. Sometimes if they're they're a large organization, they have an internal PR person or communications person as well. Um, what we try to do is be on the same page with marketing. We want to make sure we're all aligned on the same goals. 
we're telling the same stories, we're hitting the same message points. And then well, they they'll diverge into marketing channels like um, you know perhaps a paid online ad or something like a billboard. We will take those messages and refine them to be something that the news media would be interested in. So we'll we'll take whatever we've all agreed to be our our main talking points, and we will find something within those that is newsworthy, um, so that we can craft a story that we know will be appealing to their target news. So if it's a financial story, you know, we'll say, okay, what would a Bloomberg or a Forbes or a Fortune want to know within this narrative and develop news in news angles for the company within that. And then sometimes we'll also work with the leadership and say, as an expert in your industry, we think there's a great opportunity for you to do thought leadership and be an expert comment, do expert commentary, within other news that's happening or, you know, go on a TV program or have an opportunity to speak in front of a, a trade group or an industry conference. Um, there's lots of different ways that, that PR can underpin a marketing program. Do, do you have the, um, the publications, the Forbes or the fortunes, do they ever come to you saying, Hey, do you have somebody that can opine on this topic or provide some expertise? Absolutely. Yes, that happens a lot. Sometimes it's because we have a relationship with them and they reach out and they say, I'm working on something. And we know you've given us great people in the past. You know, who do you have? Um, there's also other channels. There's there's um, it's, it's an acronym is called HARO, which PR people will recognize. It actually stands for help a reporter out. And reporters will publish onto HARO and they'll say, I'm writing an article on XYZ and I need an expert who can talk about these particular topics. Who, who do you have for me? So it's a bit of a give and take there. Okay. Um, now, Amanda, so a lot of, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, sure. Uh, Amanda, I mean, there's obviously, we, we've seen some companies really wish they had better PR um, handling crises. Um, can you give us a couple examples and like do's and don'ts and some real life, you know, current, current event examples of, uh, you know, really trying to control the narrative where they did a good job or did a, a poor job? Oh, sure. Unfortunately, there, like you said, there's far too many. Um, yes, any company, especially company with shareholders or has a large public image, the best thing they can do is be prepared for a crisis. So we'll actually help a company develop what we call a crisis playbook. We'll put together talking points and establish spokespersons and decide what can and cannot be said and be really ready if something goes wrong. Um, if you are, however, caught underwear, so that, that there's there's ways you can still re respond in a way that's smart for your business. So designate who is talking on behalf of your company and make sure nobody else does. Make sure those people are, are very prepared with the right talking points and they know how to respond if things get a little murky or difficult with a reporter. Um, rely on your PR team, make sure they are there to help you media train or refine messages. Um, the most important thing you can do is keep an eye on what's being said. Make sure you know what the press is covering about you, how they're spinning the narrative, um, even what your customers or other people are saying in public forums so that you can respond in time to what's going on. And the thing that I always say is the most important in those situations is be honest. Give the full story, explain what happened, come clean, because that's your best chance of winning back your reputation. Uh, in terms of companies doing it well or badly, um, I, you know, uh, one example I, I thought from the end of last year was uh, the CEO of ChatGPT. I thought he handled the situation very, very well when, when he was being pushed out of the leadership there. Not only did he stay above board with the messages he was posting about the company, he went and spoke directly to the people at the company, his former team, and congratulated them and tried to reassure them about what was going on. And I honestly think that led directly to his being reinstated as as a CEO there. I, I, I think a little bit having the, um, the the bonus pool and stock options being granted to them was a little bit of a reason, too. They didn't want to see that stock price collapse and uh, keeping Sam Altman in place. Gave him a little higher probability. Maybe that would come to being a value to him. But I know he did. A, he, you're, you're absolutely right. He did a great job in communicating both internally and externally um, yes. and, and kind of staying above the fray, just positioning himself as being 
yeah, indispensable you know, to the business. And, yeah, in, in a certain way. Now, how would you think of a company like Tesla that's famously gotten rid of their you know, PR department? And do, could they benefit from actually having that back in place and doing more PR? I, I think any company, especially one as as high prior high profile and with a, a very publicly well known leader like Tesla, could benefit. I, I actually have some friends who worked in PR at Tesla and had some stories that would astonish a lot of people. Apparently, it's not the easiest place um, to be a PR person be, because their leadership is is so unpredictable, and you know it tends to buck the trends. Um, but yes, especially when you have something like that, where, where your leader is, is well known outside of, of being just the head of the company, uh, it's it's always valuable to have a reputation manager by your side who helps you to control those messages going on, helps respond to the press. Somebody like Elon Musk, uh, they're getting calls all the time from reporters asking for commentary or asking for updates. Having someone who has a steady hand at the wheel, knowing exactly what to say to those reporters, maybe has a relationship with them, knowing the types of stories they're developing, that that can only help you, especially when you're busy running a business or, or two businesses in, in his case now. Right. Man, I got a, I got a question. I mean, it's why, if you were talking to me, say I was a CEO of a, of a company, why, why is it so important to tell the to tell the right story in order to get the right message. Yeah, that that's a fantastic question because very often I even have clients right now saying to me, "Oh, you know, we have this wonderful story that you know we'll we'll tell this angle on," and I'll say, "Well, let's always remember what our goal is because PR isn't just about telling a story; it's about encouraging people to take an action. So, what is that action you're looking for? Is it?" that you want people, you're trying to attract investors, you're trying to attract employees, you're trying to attract customers, you want someone to buy your product, you want to en enhance your, your public reputation. What is that final outcome that you're looking for from this PR? And based on that, there could be you know any number of ways you could tell a single story that would either accomplish that or work against it. So it's always very important to keep that end goal in mind and tell the story that will reach the right people in the right way to encourage them to take the action that, that you're hoping for. I, I have another question about a company. And obviously, one over the last year, one of the biggest PR mess ups was with Bud Light. And now they're in a position of trying to continue to dig themselves out and reposition themselves. I mean, they, they, they found a way to alienate everybody. Um, with their behavior. I, I, I've been reading that they're going to be coming out with more humorous kind of ads and the Super Bowl ads and stuff. Are you familiar with what they're doing or what would you have done differently, you know, in guiding them through that, that problem? They had? Uh, yeah, you know, humor is always a good way to, to show the public that you can acknowledge that you're laughing at yourself and that you might have made a mistake. Um, honestly, I would have advised them to just be much more aware of, of their brand heritage. They have an enormous lineage of people knowing who they are and what they stand for. And to always build your future on what you've done well in the past, knowing clearly who your target is, who your, who your audience is, who your, in this case, who their consumers are, and tailoring your message and what you're trying to do to, to what the people in, in that category want to hear from you. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just, I just heard they hired Shane Gillis, the comedian as their new spokesman and he was brand loyal through, <laughs> he was very brand loyal, um, throughout the whole process. Um, how, what, what size, how, how does a company know that they're ready to invest in PR when, when in the business cycle or evolution of a company? Does that really come to the forefront? The need for to have a PR, to have PR. Yeah, I I'd, I'd say pretty early on. Surprisingly, it's it, when you need to really start attracting external not, uh, awareness about what you're doing, or if you have a lot of competition who are taking up a lot of 
space in your industry are making a lot of noise. If you're about to launch something new or interesting, or perhaps if you're a startup and you're launching something that isn't readily understood by the public, if you're creating something new and you have to explain it or educate, um, if anytime you, you want to reach a large number of people or influence the opinions of a large number of people, then it's always a good way to start with PR. There's, there's smaller and less focused, less more focused reasons rather. Um, if you have a CEO who has a great way of speaking about things or um, you know will we'll be a terrific ambassador for your brand, you can do thought leadership with that person. If you have some unusual tale about the way a product was developed or how you attracted your investors or, or there's something that you want to share with your public, those are all great reasons to just develop a relationship with with the with the news media and with with the people who are paying attention to you or in gathering more people to pay attention to you. All good reasons. Well, now there's obviously a cost to do that. Um, generally, it's some thousands of dollars a, a month to to do that. But then there's also a a resource allocation that has to be made to it. I would think how how much time does the person, the, the COO or CEO or founder need to be committed to putting in to, for a successful PR project? Well, it really depends on the team. So we don't work with a ton of CEOs or COOs because they're really very busy. So if they have a communications lead or a marketing lead, that person, we, we typically ask for about four hours a week from that person because honestly, as much as we love our clients and we love to learn all about them, we will never know their business as well as they do. We need to have somebody on the inside who can guide us and tell us what new is happening, what interesting is going on, what what projects are in the works. Um, as far as the, the senior leadership, maybe a few hours a month, um, if we can get them news coverage, if we can get them included in a story. Sometimes we'll write a bylined article on their behalf, in which case we'll need to interview them get their take on the latest things happening in the industry. It's not too much of a, of a time commitment, but it is important to give your PR team some of your time because then they'll only be that much more successful. Do those P, those um, byline articles, do they cost, do you, do you pay for those placements or do the publications no. accept them? No. No, that, that's a very good question. So right now there's a lot of, of rise in what's called pay for play, where a publication generally one, not well known or, you know, people who really aren't news are coming to a company and saying, oh, you know, we'll, we'll publish something on your behalf and pay us this amount of money. That's not what we consider PR. That's what we would call pay for play. There's a lot of very reputable publications out there who know that they can get terrific content from from leadership or or other businesses and they will say we'll work with your pr term your pr team to develop an outline and and decide on what we're going to have you write about and then we'll publish it under your byline in our publication we we do that a lot well uh, i want to thank you amanda that was a great show I, I appreciate all the insight it's obviously something i think almost every company needs to be considering whether they're engaging someone like you or, or not they they obviously need to be aware of how they're presented to the public and what their the perception of the public is of what they provide. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Okay. Um, our next guest on Money Matters TV is Todd Reed of Keller Williams Real Estate. Thank you for watching Money Matters TV, where your money matters. See you next time.